Welcome everyone and thank you for attending our exhibitor hosted session on the comparison of US FDA related to IND submission process and Health Canada CTA clinical trial application to support first and healthy human phase one clinical trials. We have that natural tendency to focus on what it takes to support submissions from a US IND application perspective, investigation or new drug and to think about what the FDA needs. What we're going to present today is a comparison contrasting the required studies and the process to support an IND submission to the FDA and a submission and support to clinical application in Canada. There are a lot of similarities, but also some differences, which really presents as an opportunity for an alternate path to initiate phase one clinical trials. Before we get into this, just a brief description of who we are at Alta Sciences. We are a mid-sized full-service contract research organization. In the full sense of the word CRO, we support both preclinical and clinical research. We've been around for over 25 years. We've got a strong leadership team, many of whom have experience in the CRO clinical as well as the preclinical realm. Outside of all the science itself, we've got a good understanding of what sponsors need and how to support them from small to large size companies. We have scientists with backgrounds in pharma, biotech and academia, as well as contract research organization. We're located in both the United States and Canada. Our preclinical site is located in the Seattle area in Washington state. We have clinical capabilities in both Canada and the Montreal area, as well as the United States and Kansas City. In addition, we have experience in a full service CDMO manufacturing operation in the Philadelphia area. What we would like to stress here is that whether you have a single study or a complete program, our goal is to simplify your drug development process with speed and ease. Looking at the entire drug development timelines from discovery all the way into market application and beyond, our services span the entire process. With our bioanalytical testing capabilities, non-GLP all the way through GLP, and supporting clinical analysis, which allows us to help the selection of lead candidates. Of course, we support the whole safety assessment evaluation from preclinical to clinical development. But what really differentiates ourselves is, is that a project management team is available to coordinate the whole package, to monitor the different moving pieces and ensure a smooth transition from the preclinical to clinical services. Lastly, our manufacturing and analytical services dedicated to small molecule are there to support the entirety of the process from the identification of a lead molecule to create the material to support your early preclinical studies, all the way through supporting the regulatory CGMP expectations for market materials. Our presenters today, myself, Julie Forget, Director of Safety Assessment at Alta Sciences, and I'll be presenting the first part about the preclinical programs to support an IND or a CDE submission. Then my colleague, Paul Sidney, who's the Senior Director of Compliance and Regulatory Affairs, We'll be presenting the regulatory aspect of comparing and contrasting those two submission processes. I'm sure you've all seen this type of diagram before. This is the reality of the drug development process. It puts in perspective the nature of discovery all the way through market application with your lead candidate. It probably doesn't do justice to the scope of the funnel. Obviously, in the research stage, you're identifying thousands and thousands of compounds that enter the research stage that will never make it past that. And as you proceed down the funnel, the number of compounds that pass each decision point becomes fewer and fewer. You go from research into identifying compounds to take into preclinical development to the identification of the one lead compound that's going to move forward into clinical trials and that's indicated by the CTA slash IND submission. Many of us in our career focus on IND submissions. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of us here will work primarily in the United States, are FDA-centric, and we think about what does it take to support an IND submission. 
There are obviously some differences across regulatory regions, and we'll touch on that later. So let's start with a brief overview of the different clinical phases. Phase one trials are established for the most part to evaluate the safety as the primary goal, and then pharmacokinetics, typically in healthy volunteers. Once phase one is completed, additional non-clinical studies are needed to support entry into phase two, where you're starting to evaluate the dosing regimen, efficacy in patients, and identification of the patient population. As a side note here, although each phase, each phase has its own set of objectives, the main focus always remains the safety evaluation throughout this process. Phase two then leads to phase three, when you're looking at definitive or pivotal safety and efficacy studies in patients, which hopefully ultimately leads to a marketing application and marketing approval. What I would like to highlight here is that this process is not limited to the IND submission, and as we'll discuss, can be applied equally to a CTA submission. These are some common general statements that we would like to remind people of, especially some of the smaller sponsors who are getting into the drug development process for the first time. It's important to remember that each preclinical program is unique and there's really no such thing as one size fits all. There are a lot of common themes, of course, across programs. Everyone knows what's needed for a typical IND enabling program or CTA enabling program, but the individual studies themselves need to be adjusted to support the specific needs of a specific compound. Whether it's dosing frequency, duration, animal selection, or toxicokinetic time points for sample collection, each program does need to be uniquely tailored to that specific compound or specific program goals. The type of drug is also a major driver in the overall design of the program. The common goal for all of our preclinical programs is to support entry into the clinic, such that the clinical trials protect the human participants, and of course, the patients, once we enter patient populations. The data that we generate from our preclinical studies is essential to guide the clinical development. So we want to characterize the potential toxic effects on the target organs, the dose dependency, and the reversibility, if any, of those toxicities induced by the test article. I'm sure a lot of you have encountered this in your career, but new sponsors, when they run their first INDCTA enabling toxicology studies, and they see toxicity for the first time, they are usually very concerned that this could impact or affect their toxicology programs. Actually, this is critical to understand that this is the goal of these studies, to push the toxicity so we can identify what's going on. This is definitely something to keep in mind. Then, of course, the preclinical data is essential to guiding clinical development from identifying the safe, initial starting dose to support the dose escalation scheme, as well as identifying additional clinical monitoring that may be required outside of the normal monitoring. The first place to look in designing a program is in the guidance documents that are available, and these fall into two broad categories. The regional regulatory guidance that's provided by the FDA, Health Canada, EMA, Japanese Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, and then our other regions uh, that have their own regulatory guidances. And then we have the International Council for Harmonization, ICH. When developing preclinical and clinical programs, as well as manufacturing, we would start with the ICH and then look at the regional guidance documents for additional support as to what may be required, for example, in the given region. Some of the select guidance documents that many of you are probably very familiar with, and you've probably read them over and over again, because every time you look at them, there's another nuance. You're looking at the guidance documents specific to a given program, and you want to look again exactly what the guidance says. 
ICH-M3 is the overarching guidance for preclinical development to support clinical trials and marketing. ICHS-6 is the Bible for biotechnology-derived products, mostly focused on protein therapeutics, but a lot of the uh, concepts in ICHS-6 are also applicable to some of the newer advanced modalities, like cell therapies, gene therapies, gene editing, to name a few. ICHS-9 for anti-cancer, and then numerous other topics when you get into carcinogenicity, gene talks, reproductive, safety pharmacology, etc. We're going to focus this presentation on what's needed to support the first in human studies, in which case things like reproductive toxicology and carcinogenicity really don't come into play until later. The first consideration for developing a preclinical program is animal species. What is needed to support clinical trials from the toxicology perspective and based on the overarching principle as detailed in ICHM3 is that programs require two mammalian species, one rodent and one non-rodent. For small molecules, which until recently was the vast majority of compounds, uh, the typical species are going to be rats and dogs. But there are some other considerations that need to be taken into account because mice are acceptable rodent species and other large non-rodent species are also commonly used. That selection is based on a number of criteria, including metabolism, if there are known drug class effects that indicate one species being more suitable than another. For example, um, you may have a mouse being more suitable than a rat in a specific design. In some cases, the non-human primate may be more suitable than the dog for a small molecule development. Looking at biologics, and again, this is mostly geared towards protein therapeutics, but also oligonucleotides, gene therapies, etc. Again, for protein therapeutics, typically two species are required, but selection is also based on biological relevant, relevance, which is defined in ICHS-6 where a relevant species is one in which the test material is pharmacologically active. This leads to many situations where a single species is used for a biologic. Typically, this is a non-human primate, but there are some other situations in which there are no pharmacologically relevant species. For example, a lot of companies are developing monoclonal antibodies or antibody cocktails against the COVID spike protein. In these cases, there really are no relevant species because the antibodies target the virus. ICHS6 actually have a, a section, or at least a paragraph, that contemplates situations like this. And in many cases, arguments are being made that if you're going to test the protein or the antibodies or antibody cocktails in animals, then the rat might just be as relevant as a non-human primate. The identification of a relevant species for protein therapeutic is a stepwise approach. It's not just based on binding. Typically, you'll start with an in silico comparison. You're going to look at a sequence homology, uh, what is known about the activity of the therapeutic across species. Uh, in vitro comparisons, are very helpful in identifying whether the molecule actually binds to or has activity in the species that's potentially being selected. But the ultimate driver is the in vivo activity. Does the biologic therapeutic have the necessary in vivo activity to identify it as a relevant species? If we look at the type of studies that are needed to support first in human, it starts with genotoxicity. For small molecule drugs, genotoxicity is required, except in some certain cases, especially in an oncology setting. But for the majority of the small molecule drugs, genotoxicity is essential to support entry into phase one first in human studies. The two in vitro assays, the bacterial mutation, the AIMS, and the in vitro chromosomal aberration study are required. The third study listed here, the in vivo chromosome aberration, is not required to enter phase one, but it is required to enter phase two.
Many times, however, we've seen sponsors to conduct this study even at the pre or prior to entry into first and human studies. For biologics, it's not typically needed. It's known that protein therapeutics or proteins themselves don't have an effect on chromosomes. There is a sort, a sort of a gray area when it comes to therapeutics like peptides. Uh, some regulatory bodies, or essentially, if you look at the FDA, some divisions within the FDA expect genotoxicity, even for peptide therapeutics, while others look, look at it and see a small version of a protein therapeutic. General toxicology studies are required for all compounds, small and large molecules. Uh, typically, there are short-term studies required to support phase one, long-term or subchronic studies to support phase two, and then chronic studies to support phase three clinical trials. Safety pharmacology is also required in most cases for small molecule drugs to evaluate potential impact on critical organ systems. It covers cardiovascular, respiratory, and central nervous system. While this is required for small molecule drugs, it really becomes product specific for protein therapeutics and other biotechnology derived products. It's not unusual to have preclinical programs for biologics that include just a couple of endpoints on the general tox studies to demonstrate that they don't have any adverse effect on these organ systems. Then we have the tissue cross-reactivity that is uniquely required for monoclonal antibodies or protein therapeutics uh, that have monoclonal antibody-like properties, particularly CDRs, complementary determining regions, that are going to direct, direct them to bind to just one specific antigen or epitope. Of course, uh, this study is not required for small molecule drugs. Let's review some other important considerations when developing programs to support the preclinical development of new therapeutics. It's worth repeating that each preclinical program is unique. There's no such thing as one size fit all, fits all approach. There are specialized approaches like life threatening indications, especially for oncology. Streamlined programs are accepted and really the regulatory agencies are encouraging drug developers to get new therapeutics for life-threatening indication into the clinic, into patients as quickly as possible. Uh, there are other specialized approaches for certain routes of administration like dermal, ocular product, and then for imaging agents. You can never underestimate the importance of assay development for both your clinical and your preclinical programs. A lot of companies have encountered situations where they're ready to start their preclinical studies, but they don't have the appropriate assays in place. Like listed here, dose formulation analysis, serum or plasma concentration assays to support toxicokinetics, or evaluation of immunogenicity for protein therapeutics. Test article supply is often a limiting factor. It's easy to underestimate the, un the amount of material required to support your preclinical studies. Communication also is really key for both preclinical as well as your clinical development to address everything from the route of administration, dosing frequency, dosing duration, drug supply, and assay development. So coordination, communication, especially between the two teams is essential. Then, as I mentioned on an earlier slide, the guidance documents are out there to really drive how programs should be designed. Guidance documents are essential to make sure that all expectations of the regulatory agencies will be met. The regulatory agencies themselves have processes for soliciting inputs. There are colleagues and other internal experts at your organization or outside that have been through the process before and may have some insight. Then, of course, consultants. There are a lot of expert consultants in every area to support preclinical and clinical development. So it's important to remember that you don't have to do everything by yourself. Someone probably has already encountered a similar issue and figured out how to resolve it. Therefore, why not take advantage of their expertise and their knowledge? I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Paul Sidney to get into the regulatory considerations for first in human clinical trials. Thanks for uh, the great uh, overview of the early drug development uh, 
face of um, pharmaceutical and biological um, new molecular entities. Um, this is Paul Sidney. I'm the Senior Director of Compliance and Regulatory Affairs at Alta Sciences. And uh, my goal today is to walk through and carry forward with respect to the preclinical and how that preclinical data um, supports a, a first in human um, trial, clinical trial. So essentially we chose specifically to use the term first in human enabling studies versus IND enabling studies to highlight the fact that preclinical data may support clinical trials outside the US. So the adoption of uh, global receiving authorities, the ICH has become the default guidance, as Joe has said, for drug development. And the fact that US FDA regulations allow for foreign data to support NDAs, this may provide a rationale for some of um, you all, uh, or the advice to regulatory affair consultants, um, or, or uh, pharmaceutical firms to use the drug development strategy to conduct clinical research outside the US. As with preclinical data, the OECD nations, um, through the MAD agreement, uh, mutual acceptance of data, permit preclinical data to, uh, to conduct and submit uh, and are accepted as safety data in support of drug submissions uh, in all the OECD group of nations, including Canada and US. Similarly, with clinical trial data, uh, it can be conducted outside the US if they're conducting uh, to their set standards, but specifically ICH standards. So the scope of uh, my section of our, our chat today is to use uh, Health Canada CTA process and submissions uh, and content as an example of how preclinical data supporting clinical trials um, that's conducted in the US um, can, can facilitate um, acceptance and approval for clinical trials first in, in human. So the agenda, um, as noted, um, tried to structure it so that first and foremost, just basically what, why is the strategy for conducting trials outside of the US considered? And as I've said, the example I'm choosing is, is Canada, but it could be others, Australia, uh, countries in Europe. Um, but we'll, we'll take Canada, I'm most familiar with that, so it's um, easier to walk through. Uh, FDA acceptance of foreign clinical trials, uh, the review of FDA regulations permitting the use of foreign data in, in drug submissions is something I want to walk through. There's a, a clear regulatory uh, approval on this and some great guidances that help um, folks put that filing together and understand what's the deliverable if they're conducting trials outside of the US uh, to ensure that it's accepted in, in an FDA IND. Um, similar differences between FDA and H and Health Canada clinical trial approval processes is something I wanna cover. And I also wanna walk through and discuss Health Canada's pre-CTA process, which is equivalent to the pre-IND meeting uh, in uh, process content and deliverables, but as you'll as you'll hear me say um, several times, that the process for pre CTA is a, a narrower scope, and it may prove uh, simpler not only for the CTA or the clinical trial authorization process, but including the pre CTA process. Um, CTA submission uh, is comparable to um, FDA, and I'll walk through that. And then just finally an overview and summary of what we've, we've talked through. So the strategy for conducting trials outside of the US, um, I mean, in the case in Canada, regulatory affairs professionals may consider the following. First, sponsors are not required to have an open IND to conduct a study in Canada. And with the amount of work and the fact that you're developing an IND for an overall clinical program, this may be a, a, an easier route to gain clinical data earlier on in your drug development program. Um, second point, first in human patient studies can be conducted shortly after the first in human enabling non-clinical safety research uh, is completed. Um, based on Health Canada does not require the final report to be submitted in the CTA submission. Uh, the studies will eventually be submitted, but at, at the stage of a, a given trial, 
and in accordance with um, what's required, the submission would only be necessary should you decide to file for a market approval and an NDS or new drug submission in Canada. Uh, this means uh, speed and flexibility and lower costs um, without compromising quality or ethics. Uh, Canadian study data meets global and FDA EMA standards. And you know, the Canadian studies can be used to support, as I've said, international filing. Not only FDA, which we're talking about here, as Joe said, many of the programs in the US are for IND enabling, but very often it's either prior to or immediately or concurrent, there's an EMA filing as well and or Health Canada filing. What the take home message is, um, it's a streamlined process for drug development strategy within, within Canada. Uh, companies may want to initiate safety and proof of concept studies with the substantial investment effort required for an IND in the USA, uh, as, as noted. INDs are primarily for clinical trial programs covering all the phases one through four, whereas Health Canada's authorization is per clinical trial. Um, Health Canada reviews and comments on aspects of the study design endpoints and subject safety on each clinical trial submitted, whether phase one safety or proof of concept. And this provides immediate feedback and gives the submitter a perspective of what would be expected on a stepwise staged fashion, or as I, say, I like to say, an iterative process. Sponsors are, are exposed to a level of regulatory review and scrutiny prior to their IND submissions, which is also sometimes a goal uh, to get that kind of feedback prior to submitting to the U US FDA. Um, and the resulting studies can be, as I said, used for ultimate filing within the FDA. So as, as I've said, um, it's an iterative process. It's stepwise in nature, and the CTA documentation deliverables are focused on the goals and safety required for a single clinical study. And in this case, what we're focusing on, Joe and I, is to talk through what would be uh, required for a first in human clinical trial. Health Canada provides, um, as I said, useful and valuable feedback during the review period that can be used not only for Health Canada filing, um, once uh, no objection letter is received, in other words, an approval of the filing, um, but also equally so for international filings, FDA, EMA going forward. So the point I wanted to note here um, in this slide is something that I suspect many of you may know already, but I, I thought I'd review it, uh, is the fact that the FDA does accept foreign clinical studies, and it's actually written directly into the food and drug regulations. Um, Title 21 CFR uh, Part 314, 106 uh, does specify that, that foreign trials can be uh, accepted as part of a filing for the FDA, and they detail the expectations of what would be a deliverable for those foreign trials in the uh, regulation 3.112.120. Uh, what I've listed here in this slide is a, a particular guidance that's very well written, detailing uh, the acceptance criteria and the expectations as specified in the regulations. Uh, as a point of reference, most of the studies, for instance, in Alta Science, are conducted um, for filing an NDA and ANDA submission. And uh, the institutions are audited by international health authorities to confirm compliance with the ICHE6 uh, guidance, the clinical uh, GCP requirements, thus assuring that um, the trial will meet the FDA expectation. And that's what I want to share in this next slide. Um, Essentially, the regulations detail two key elements, which is if you're conducting the work um, outside, the studies should be conducted in accordance with GCP, 
Um, once again, you'll notice the recurring theme here that complying with the ICH guidances will um, assure that your work is going to be accepted. Um, include, review, and approve uh, the approval by the IEC or what Canada calls a Research Ethics Committee or IRB. If those two elements are met, uh, then the FDA will be accepting um, the trials. Now, in the case of Canada, um, the seven points that are detailed in 312.120 are all inherent in the review of a research ethics committee and a clinical trial authorization. So in the case of investigator qualification, it's specified in a CTA and verified by the Research Ethics Committee, or IRB, as you may more familiarly uh, know. Uh, the second point, um, description of the research facility. The CTA requires that, that this information is maintained within a, a specified form template. It's called a clinical trial site information form, and that has to be submitted uh, following a, a CTA approval. So check two there as far as uh, requirements for the FDA. Third element, uh, details summary of the protocol and study results, uh, case records. Protocol is, is reviewed by the Research Ethics Committee in Health Canada. And the subsequent clinical trial data is, um, because it's conducted within uh, the, the guidance of ICHE6, would certainly meet um, the requirements that are, are required and specified by this uh, regulation. Uh, the fourth item uh, is delving uh, more into the drug product description and drug substance. Uh, and that also is um, some, a, a deliverable for a CTA. Uh, quality overall summary is the document that would be submitted in what is known as uh, module two in the ICHM4 guidance. Uh, and that information is easily meeting the requirements for a CMC filing. Uh, in fact, if you have filed uh, or have started preparing your IND, you may have already developed or your chemical group may have already developed an IMPD. Um, and that IMPD could be used interchangeably between uh, what you're planning to submit for IND and or the CTA. Um, the fifth item, study effectiveness and adequate and well controlled, as I've said already, that's a default if you're following the uh, E6 GCPs. Uh, the sixth item, uh, we've talked through also, what's once again, uh, if filed by um, the firm for CTA filing, there would be a requirement to have an IRB or R, as Canada calls the Research Ethics Committee review, and that would meet that specification. And finally, uh, by virtue of uh, complying with the E6, the last item, which is that the PI is trained and conducts the study in accordance with GCP. So you can see that Canada's one example, and they do default Health Canada to the ICH uh, regulations. In fact, uh, E6 is built in with, within the Food and Drug uh, Act within Canada. And so you're assured uh, of meeting the uh, regulations of uh, FDA. But similarly, uh, it could be said for many of the um, countries and receiving authorities that do abide by the ICH guidances. The other um, point that um, I just wanted to highlight here is the similarity between agencies. Uh, there are, as you well know, um, various centers that are focusing specifically on um, their area of expertise. So within uh, this particular presentation, we're talking primarily of biologics, which would be CBER and small molecule, um, which would be a CEDAR or Center for Drug Evaluation, an equivalent group within Health Canada, which is titled a directorate, would, would oversee that. So CBER would have its counterpart, Biologic and Radiopharmaceutical Drug Directorate. Uh, 
and Cedar would have the Therapeutics Products Directorate. So those are the two areas that you would be um, looking to file under uh, if you chose to file uh, within Canada. This slide details some of the differences and similarities between the FDA and Health Canada uh, but for regulatory drug development strategy and how it incorporates overall clinical milestones. So Health Canada, as noted earlier, is granting approval for a single phase, which lightens the burden as to the amount of preclinical data required in particular phase one trials. Uh, as per ICHE8, uh, expectations for the CTA submission align with preclinical trial program and, and is supported fundamentally to get a, a, a good understanding of the general risk management uh, of the health human healthy human volunteers, and would assess initial study dose, planned dose escalation, and clinical monitoring, um, trial, trial design, and so on. Second point would be, as noted, the IND is more substantive as the approval is for a complete clinical program. Uh, Health Canada does not require a fee for review of processing of CTA submissions. Therefore, there's no additional cost if, if the strategy is to run uh, the clinical trial first in, in a Health, uh, Health Canada research clinic. Um, in FDA, equally, the IND doesn't require uh, a fee, but of course, the overall review would be part of the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, and there would be uh, a commensurate cost depending on the type of filing. And, and the current uh, issuance of the User Fee Act. Another aspect to consider when you're filing um, with F uh, FDA and Health Canada, um, Health Canada requirements for applying for and gaining a CT approval is, is a bit broader than the FDA, specifically for bioequivalency studies. Uh, phase one trials do require a CTA approval uh, comparative bioavailability studies do require uh, a CTA. And if the drug is already approved, in other words, if it has a drug identification number or if they've uh, um, gained a notice of compliance but with condition, um, then there may be some qualification still requiring um, a CTA filing, uh, whether the indication, uh, whether there's a difference in the indication in clinical use. Uh, the target population, patient population is different, uh, route of administration or dosage regimen. So that's something that you'd have to consider when you are filing. But in most cases, it's quite similar. And as I've mentioned, uh, one should uh, be aware that if there is a notice of compliance, uh, one should review if it is a notice of compliance with condition. Um, but by and large, clinical trials involving marketed drugs uh, where the investigation to be conducted within the parameters of the authorized uh, notice of compliance or, or drug identification number, uh, then no, no CTA would be required. So as I mentioned earlier uh, in the opening comment of points to, to cover, I just want to get into some of the mechanics now of, of what would be the standard milestones, as, as you're, I'm sure, quite familiar with the within the IND process. There is a parallel uh, situation in, in Canada with Health Canada, but keeping in mind always that um, the work effort may be um, substantively uh, simpler and lighter because it's not for the overall program. It, it's focusing for a given clinical trial. So in the case of a pre-CTA pre submission, uh, the process and content, I'd like to walk through that. So the process uh, initially um, would um, be to gain a, a filing. So you'd want to first submit a form or a cover letter and that cover letter should provide a brief synopsis of the proposed study, a list of the questions to be addressed by, by the directorate uh, during the meeting and identification of specific areas uh, that you, you may wish to, to cover. That may be a consultation with members of the quality division uh, or if there are clinical aspects that you're wishing to get some clarity on for, for that given trial. Uh, that should look very similar 
Um, but as I said uh, to those that have been and have participated in IND, uh, but it would be very narrow to that specific trial. Um, recommendation is proposed for dates and times suitable for a pre-CTA consultation meeting um, to allow Health Canada to decide how they can convene a group um, for on their side, what would work on their side, prepare and submit the pre-CTA information package, and that package should be submitted 30 days before uh, agreed upon, uh, the agreed upon date. Uh, should you be granted a pre-CTA, because it's not absolute that you'll be granted one, much like pre, the pre-IND, um, these days of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, there, there may be a review and feel that there's no need to file a pre-CTA, that the, the information that you have uh, provided in the briefing packet should support a, a CTA, as you may Note uh, the same holds true on the FDA. We're rarely uh, visiting um, the FDA now. Clearly, you'll, you'll be getting more likely a written response to your pre IND queries and package. Um, so, so it's quite comparable, as I said, to Health Canada. Um, should you be granted one, um, the key would be, and the onus is on the um, sponsor to maintain minutes and then subsequently submit within 14 days of that consultation date uh, the account of that uh, particular meeting. So a little bit more detail on the uh, information package itself and the deliverables. Um, so as you can see, first of all, as I've mentioned, proposed agenda any prepared preliminary slides because you may choose to talk to those slides as you're presenting it to the Health Canada officials that um, have committed to participate in the call. Um, and you should also make a complete list of the attendees, not, uh, not solely the, uh, your attendees, the sponsor and any consultants that you may have, but also the Health Canada attendees. A uh, brief summary of all data, including uh, tabular listing of preclinical and clinical studies. Um, and that's a, a key point there, tabular listing. I, I do like to have that overall summary, uh, and that's aligned with ICH, which I'll talk about a little bit later in my presentation about following the investigator brochure uh, guidance in ICHE6 as far as format. That is very much a default and an expectation of Health Canada. And in that light, um, if you have preclinical study summaries, they do want it in a tabular fashion so they can um, easily map the results of the various trials and preclinical studies that you've done. And in fact, if you've done any clinical studies prior to filing. Um, an outline of the observed talks, uh, manifestations, and a discussion of their impact on the use of the drug in humans. Um, and this would be quite narrow, as I've said, I'm repeating myself here, but this would be specific to the trial as opposed to an overall program. So the, the focus of your, your summary, if as toxicologists you've been asked to prepare this summary, uh, it, it would be a narrower summary um, focusing on the risks for that specific trial. An outline of the observed adverse events and discussion of potential safety problems is also deliverable. Um, some of the other points, proposed global clinical plan, which wouldn't necessarily uh, affect this immediate audience, but is, is what's normally put together by, by sponsors. Uh, details of the proposed clinical trial. Uh, you may have a combo trial, so that's why they have trials per se, but it's usually a specific phase um, uh, that would be conducted in Canada. A uh, summary of the uh, what you would commonly or typically remember uh, if you filed IND would be the CMC or QOS, um, which is in the module two of the ICHM4. Um, these are, are the primary deliverables. And I did make a, a bullet below for those that are filing bi biologics or radiopharmaceutics. There is a, a bit more detail expected for um, the CMC, uh, where they'd expect production sites, summary of manufacture for each uh, drug substance and dose form. 
and the QC procedures and specs and pr product characteristics, uh, characteristics. So a little bit more detail for, for biologics. This is um, a very simplified uh, process of a CTA filing. Uh, it provides a very high level of view of the, the straightforward CTA submission process. First um, milestone is upon uh, submission, there's a screening process uh, conducted by Health Canada to ensure that the filing uh, meets uh, the, the basic requirements for a CTA filing. And typically you'll get a feedback within 24 hours. However, once again, with the uh, COVID pandemic uh, impact, it may be a, a little bit longer. It could be anywhere from 48 to 72 hours, but usually within um, two to three days, you'll get uh, an answer on that. If there are any screening deficiencies, you'll be asked to correct those screening deficiencies within a, a very brief period, um, within 24 hours um, of submitting. Um, and uh, once those, any, if there are any screening deficiencies, if they're acceptably addressed, you'll get an acknowledgement letter from the agency from Health Canada, and that officially starts the clock for the review. Um, typically that's um, under Food and Drug Law, it's 30-day review um, begins. Uh, there is, for bioequivalency studies, uh, a shorter administrative goal of seven-day review, uh, and that's usually pretty well respected, but once again, with COVID pandemic, it could be a little bit longer, but overall, it's, it's uh, outside of COVID timeframe, very well respected. Uh, the review is a, a parallel review process where both clinical and quality and chemistry uh, specialists look at uh, the filing separately. And Health Canada may issue um, during the process review of review information requests during that 30-day period. And much like the screening deficiency, if there are any IRs, as we call them, or information requests, you're given two days to respond uh, to those uh, queries um, to allow the review to continue um, by Health Canada. Uh, if the, if the um, CTA, the Clinical Trial Organization submission is deemed acceptable, you'll receive a no objection letter, at which point you can start uh, recruiting um, for the trial, uh, screening for the trial, and um, import uh, the, the drug of interest. Uh, if uh, on the negative side, if there are serious concerns within the IR um, and you need to address them and, and look at it more substantively, you are able to withdraw without prejudice and, and um, refile at a, at a later date. Um, so there, there is an opportunity to refile should there be significant rework. Um, one point uh, to keep in mind with the COVID pandemic, some of the timelines have changed. Uh, on uh, a positive front, if you're working on a COVID therapy, the CTA approval process has actually been expedited, much like in the FDA. It has a, a faster track. Health Canada issued an interim order uh, early, uh, earlier in this year, in the spring of this year, uh, and has committed to within 14 day review time frame for COVID therapy. So there is an expedited review. Um, on the flip side of that, because of um, the second wave uh, increase in work uh, uh, of the COVID therapy, the health minister has uh, issued a ministerial order to allow a 15-day uh, extension on the 30-day review time frame up until November 16th of this year, just to ensure that Health Canada doesn't default on the review. I would qualify this, and because of the fact that Alta Sciences does process a, a lot of and submit many uh, submissions, this is by no means a default. Uh, Health Canada doesn't automatically go to 45 days, and in, in fact, in many cases, they are meeting or exceeding the 30-day time frame review. 
but they just included that 15 day time frame to ensure they don't default on, on, a, on a filing. The CTA submission process and content, Health Canada accepts uh, ECDD and CDD format. There's no requirement for um, hyperlinking. Uh, you can file it uh, in, a, in a standalone CTD uh, format. Uh, sponsors may submit, as I've noted here, in an electronic format, either PDF or MS, um, Microsoft Word, uh, but it, it must not be in paper. It has to be in electronic uh, file format. Uh, Health Canada does not require, as does FDA, a uh, send or CDISC file formatting for preclinical studies. And in fact, uh, there is no requirement to submit. As I said, this is not a clinical um, trial um, program review, but a study review. And with that, then there's no requirement for the tox toxicology reports uh, to be submitted uh, as they are uh, with an M4 filing for an IND. There is a uh, bilingual um, requirements, but it's an either or. So in the case of uh, CTA's filing, it can be submitted as English or French. Uh, Alta Science typically files the submissions in, in English. Uh, CTA must be submitted uh, to the appropriate directorate as, as would be the case with the FDA uh, with Seeger and Cedar. So now moving forward uh, to uh, the specifics. Uh, CTA review, um, Health Canada process allocates the clinical and quality sections to be assessed by separate offices, I've, as I've mentioned. Uh, the CTA reviewer may uh, issue a Clarifax or an, or, or an information request, uh, which I've walked through, which would require a 48-hour turnaround. Um, they do on occasion allow for uh, a bit more time and we have um, a very close relationship with as a stakeholder and so they are not absolute on those time frames but you should try to strive to get the 48 hour time frame but um, on occasion you can uh, negotiate uh, another 24 hour time frame uh, but you shouldn't bank on that obviously but they're they're not as fixed and firm um, following the health canada no objection letter, um, sponsor may choose to withdraw, as I've said, um, if they receive an IR um, that does preclude, or it's likely will preclude an NOL, and that withdrawal can be done without prejudice, so you can refile without any uh, issue. Uh, updates to clinical trials are made through a CTA amendment or notification, um, a very straightforward process. Um, clinical study reports do not have to be submitted to Health Canada unless you're planning for a, a Canadian market approval. Um, and there are no annual reports required under CTA. As I've said, this is not for a program, it's for a given study. And so that precludes the need for a, an annual report. This uh, triangle, I'm sure for many of you that have helped in an IND filing, um, will look very similar. I think the noticeable point that I, I've tried to capture in this diagram is that the submission is limited to as little as two modules, module one and two, and uh, sometimes module three does have to be included, but very often um, merely a quality overall summary for the CMC is required. And so that's something that has to be looked at uh, per filing. Um, but it does very clearly highlight um, that the filing is, is much lighter. Uh, as you may note, the preclinical talk section is limited to the summaries embedded in an investigator brochure in module one, um, which highlights the fact that a, a report is not required. This slide just gives a little further drill down of what would be expected within the module one. Um, once again, very similar to an IND. The main differences I've highlighted several times over is that it would focus on a single clinical trial you're looking to gain approval for. Uh, 
Um, the investigator brochure is the document that would be used by yourselves as professional toxicologists to provide the primary deliverables with respect to the safety uh, as acquired through your preclinical research. And as I said to you uh, earlier in my chat, um, the guidance for the formatting on that, you should follow the ICH E6 guidance uh, embedded uh, in, in that guidance is the IB um, format and content. The IB uh, document, as, you'll, as you note, uh, your deliverables as uh, toxicologists and as the audience here, that's what I'm focusing on, would be in section five, primarily the non-clinical study section. Um, and as Joe had stated, the ICHM3 would be your guide in drafting the content of the summaries and would focus on points such as uh, maximum tolerated dose or maximum formulated dose, how, how the data supports the first in human trial safety of the subjects, basically addressing the, the generalized risk management for that group of patients. One point on this slide I want, I want to highlight also is that these references should be at the end of each chapter. Um, and include appendices, if any, for, for this particular deliverable. The non-clinical studies summary may include, uh, and you're experts on this, so I won't go in, in detail. It should be very um, obvious as professional toxicologists, and Joe has certainly highlighted some of the key elements that would be uh, required on that. You, you would obviously focus on uh, the species that are tested, number uh, and sex of animals in each group, dose, dose intervals, route of administration, dur duration of dose, uh, systemic distribution, results including following aspects such as the, the nature and frequency of the pharmacological or toxicological effects, uh, severity of the intensity of the uh, pharmacological or toxic effects, uh, time of onset, reversibility of effects, duration of effects, and dose response. All of these are standard, um, but once, a, once again, a, a key point to this, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in, in incorporating these elements, firstly in a tabular format, and then subsequently in a, in a more uh, text-based fashion to provide um, context for the particular clinical trial is, uh, is key for your investigational brochure so that the reviewer can understand both the mechanism of action, the pharmacology, toxicity, and how that translates into the clinical trial and the design and assurance of, of safety of the subjects. Um, so coming close to the end here, this is the non-clinical studies content guidance. And, and as you can see, um, this guidance 7.3.5 of the IB, they're looking for dose response of observed effects and relevance to the humans. So they're, it's all focusing your summaries on how it translates to uh, its impact on uh, risk to a first in healthy humans. Um, the effective and non-toxic dose findings in the same animal species um, and how it supports the clinical design. So obviously you'll be working with your uh, clinical trial um, design experts and team uh, and it would um, help you design your summaries. And the comparison should be made in terms of blood tissue levels rather than on milligram per uh, kilogram basis. Uh, or you may choose actually fixed dose. That really depends on, on the, um, the trial designs and, and specifics of the trial design. Uh, a summary of the toxicological effects found in relevant studies conducted in, in different animal species should be described under the following headings where appropriate for, for first in human trials. And as Joe has, has highlighted, um, you know, there would be specific um, trials that would be uh, more um, of interest for first in human. So um, 
it would be uh, single dose, repeat dose uh, would be studies that um, you would be focusing on for um, these trials. Um, you may do irritancy studies and you would most definitely do genotox studies, at least as Joe had indicated, um, the early in vitro uh, genotox studies. So the comparison table, just for a quick reference, uh, as noted earlier, um, CTA versus IND uh, table just highlights the similarities. Uh, and I'll walk through the CTA, the principles. Uh, as noted earlier, the CTA submission is per trial. Um, sounding like a broken record, but I hopefully got the message across, whereas the IND is for an overall program. The review time, I've provided information on the CTA review period. Uh, it, it's based on the non-pandemic times, um, but as you, as you can see, um, Health Canada does respect that time frame. Uh, and in the case of BE studies, it actually beats that 30-day time frame in many cases. Um, you can withdraw without prejudice, and so there is no clinical hold per se, as with the FDA. Um, and, and so you would monitor the review and the IR feedback to decide your, your progress of that CTA filing. The CTA content, key difference to highlight is the comparison topic is the fact that Health Canada, unlike FDA, uh, does not require, not, uh, it doesn't require um, non-clinical pharmacology and toxicology reports to be submitted. And there is no obligation for a CDSC or SAND-like format to be submitted. And there are no annual reports required. So all of these um, are points that are, are considered uh, when a regulatory affairs uh, team and a company is looking to scope out their drug development plans. So in summary, uh, Health Canada, like many inter international uh, filings, um, you know, Health Canada, EMA, many of the other countries uh, that are respecting the ICH are well-respected, uh, regulated uh, receiving authorities. They adhere to international regulatory standards. Uh, they comply and meet uh, the performance standards and, and review deadlines. And to gain that reputation, they are firm but flexible and approachable and are, are typically, it's a non-adversarial relationship with the, with the stakeholder. So with that, hopefully I've given you some sense of um, what a process is like outside of the US, um, albeit in a Canadian perspective, but uh, it at least gives you a window on first in human enabling trials and how that differs solely from the term that you may be more familiar with, which is the IND enabling uh, trials. So, uh, thank you very much for um, attending our presentation. Uh, should you have any questions, we'll open up briefly for, for questions. If we don't uh, have time to respond to your questions now, uh, please don't uh, hesitate to reach out uh, through email, um, which is uh, detailed in our slides. Uh, my, my email slide is psydney at altasciences.com. Uh, Dr. Francisco's is jfrancisco at altasciences.com. Thank you very much.